Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome to today's Law of Self-Defense show. Okay. It's been a couple days, folks. Sorry. I had a lot of busy work to do over the last week or so, but I'm very happy to be back with another show. Let me make sure that everything is streaming appropriately. Everyone can sit down and make themselves comfortable. That's always Appreciate it. Hit that subscribe button, folks. If it's um, if it's red, I guess, turn it gray. Hit the like, thumbs up, all that kind of stuff. Welcome, everybody, in the Law of Self-Defense stream. That's much appreciated having you all here. Okay. Looks like everything is up and running. Get back to the comments. <clears throat> all right. For folks who don't know, I am attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense, a law practice that does nothing but use of force law, self-defense, defense of others, defense of property. And this is one of our many, many, many free videos and so forth. Let's see if I can figure out how to turn all these notifications off so that we don't have to get bothered by that. Do not disturb for one hour. That should do the trick. So um, a couple of things. We have several videos to go over today. Uh, one of them involves the, um, well, you've, most of you have probably seen the videos. Most of you have probably seen the, um, the store owner. Let's see if I can actually pull it up. I'm not going to play the video right now, but I can pull up a screen capture so you can recognize what it is I'm talking about. Here's, I call it the wine to the head video. Um, this is a uh, the gentleman in the number one shirt. He's number one, folks. The gentleman in the number one shirt is a, going to prove to be a disgruntled customer at this convenience store. He's going to punch the plastic panel between him and the clerk, and the clerk will step around the counter and kinetically deliver a bottle of wine to that guy's noggin multiple times. That's one video we're going to uh, watch together. Well, some of us will for reasons I'll share in just a moment. The second video I wanted to talk about today is this one. This is the hatchet attack in New York City. Uh, the gentleman with the backpack uh, is going to have a disagreement with some fellows in the eating area of some kind of fast food joint there. Um, there'll be some uh, modest fisticuffs. Things will settle down. And uh, then this gentleman with the backpack is going to pull out a hatchet and start destroying property and threatening people with deadly force. So we're going to talk about that case as well. And finally, there's a third video that's really very short, but it's so much fun. And it's not new. I've seen this one sometime in the past, but it came across a transom once again. <clears throat> and uh, this one involves a uh, attempted armed robbery, attempted because this dude walking into whatever this store is, uh, decides he's going to whip out a gun and hold this poor woman at gunpoint. But I guess he got baby oil all over that gun because it slides right out of his hands over the counter onto the lady side of the counter. So we'll talk about some of the legal issues uh, that may exist there. Oh, man, I got new contact lenses yesterday, and I cannot read my computer screen without my reading glasses now. Thanks, Doc. Much appreciated. See if I have, uh, these are my cheap reading glasses. Let's see if I have good ones. Hmm. All right. Those are the more fashionable reading glasses. All right. So here's the thing, folks. Uh, we're making a uh, policy change here at Law of Self-Defense. So we're always experimenting with how best to use social media and so forth. And um, for a while now, we've been... Uh, Mimicking the uh, the Nick Ricada method would be one way to put it. Of course, we, we never came close to Nick's level, but using things like super chats and memberships on YouTube and blah, 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 blah. Uh, unfortunately, at least half the time, the videos I put on YouTube get demonetized, uh, either instantly while they're in progress or immediately thereafter. Plus, Anytime someone gives me five bucks or, or 10 bucks or 20 bucks as a super chat, YouTube takes a third of that and... They have enough money as far as I'm concerned. Um, so we're changing the policy. So what we're going to do now is we will not be playing those videos you just saw. 
I will not be playing on YouTube. I'm going to talk about the legal issues in them. If you've seen those videos elsewhere, if you want to pull them up in your, on a separate tab on your own computer, feel free. Um, so I'll talk about the legal analysis of those events without playing the video for all three of those. Uh, and then I'm going to cut off YouTube, stay online with our Law of Self-Defense member feed, uh, member stream, and actually play the videos for our Law of Self-Defense members and recap the legal analysis there so you can see the analysis in the context of the actual video. Um, so instead, previously what I'd been doing, saying I would answer questions and so forth, is someone put them in super chat form. $5 minimum. Well, folks, instead of paying five bucks a, a, a show uh, to get a question is, instead you can pay $10 once, well, once a month. $10 covers an entire month of Law of Self-Defense membership. You can do that at lawofselfdefense.com. Join, in fact, let me change my little URL here, my little name. Lawofselfdefense.com, join. You don't really need the HTTPS. That makes it look clunky. <clears throat> Lawselfdefense.com slash join for less than, uh, it's about a quarter a day. It's less than $10 a month, folks. You can be a Law Self Defense member, get unlimited access to all our content online. And YouTube doesn't get a penny of that money. Uh, so let's do it that way, shall we? Uh, now, if you do decide to join during today's show, so you can catch today's analysis in the context of the actual videos, um, I would suggest doing it sooner rather than later in the course of the show. It's, it's not quite instant access. It might take a minute or five minutes for you to receive the email with your username and password. Uh, once you have that, it's very transparent. There's a link. You click it, takes it to your member dashboard. The live show is streaming right there. So it's fairly transparent. Um, but it, it's not instantaneous, so you wouldn't want to wait until the moment that we're transitioning over to the members-only stream. Uh, so that's my recommendation. Simply become a Law of Self-Defense member. Instead of five bucks a super chat to have me answer your question, I answer all the member questions. Nine ninety-five, I think it is, for a month. If you don't have a quarter a day to spend on this stuff, I don't know why you're wasting your time watching it in the first place. Um, here, Shane, I'll put this in the uh, comments and you can grab it there, I guess. Of course, like an idiot, I didn't tell anybody I was going to be doing this beforehand. Sorry about that, Shane. Uh, by the way, Shane, if you could send me an email, I would appreciate it. I got, uh, I want to make sure uh, there's something I want to chat with you about offline. So send me an email. That would be great. Okay. Um, I guess that's about it. So let's talk about the first of the videos. What order should I take them in? Let's uh, let's start. Let's start with the wine bottle to the noggin. And again, I'm not playing the video here. I'm going to pull it up. So if you've seen the video elsewhere, you'll be aware of what it is we're talking about. Is there any way to shrink that up? Yeah, there we go. Let's see. Yeah, that's better. All right, so what do we have here? Um, actually, before I start, I'm going to suggest that, suggest, I'm going to do, I'm going to take a different approach to explaining the use of force law principles here than I, than I usually do, just as an experiment. Normally, when I'm explaining use of force law, meaning self-defense, defense of others, defense of property, I'm usually uh, characterizing the law in a, in a positive way. So these are the things you need to be doing for your use of force to be lawful. And um, I do that because, well, I presume my audience is largely, hopefully entirely law-abiding people. And law-abiding people need to know how to constrain their use of force behavior so it stays uh, well within the legal boundaries. So teaching you folks this stuff in in an affirmative way. These are the things you need. These are the five elements of self-defense, right? How many times have you heard me say it? Innocence, eminent, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. Innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. By the way, we give this cheat sheet, this five elements of self-defense law cheat sheet away for free, folks. It's just a PDF download. doesn't cost a penny. If you don't understand this stuff, 
I, I don't <laughs> I don't know how to help you. Um, but you can get this at lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. All right. These are the building blocks of any claim of defensive person's justification anywhere. Um, so I normally teach people this is what has to be present in your claim of self-defense. But here's a dirty little secret. The truth is, from a legal analysis perspective, what really happens when I do legal analysis on a use of force case, which of course I do all the time, that's my law practice, or when a good prosecutor is doing an analysis of a use of force claim, they're actually doing their analysis not so much in a positive way, which of these elements are present in the defendant's narrative of self-defense, but in a negative way. Which ones are missing? From a prosecutor's perspective, from a legal analytics perspective, what we're looking for here is for one of the required elements to be missing or so vulnerable to disproof that the prosecution can disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Remember, these elements, these five elements, innocence, eminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness, are cumulative. All the required elements are, of course, required, unless for some reason one or more of them is legally waived. For example, the element of avoidance is in otherwise lawful cases of self-defense is typically waived as an element. So it's not required. So then there's only four elements to worry about. But whichever the elements are required, and there's only up to five, which is the good news. There's not 500, there's not 50, there's only up to those five and often not that many. But whichever the elements are required on the laws of your state and the facts of the case are required. They're mandatory. They have to be there. And if they're missing... What you have is not self-defense. Your, your legal justification of self-defense is very binary. It's like a light switch. Either it's on or off. Either your use of force qualifies as self-defense and you have 0% criminal liability. What you did was simply not a crime, even if it means you killed someone or killed multiple people. Was not a crime if it's within the legal boundaries of self-defense. But the catch is, if it's one inch outside those legal boundaries, if one, any one of the required elements can be disproven beyond a reasonable doubt, your, your justification doesn't just diminish. It's obliterated. It's gone. You have zero legal defense for that use of force. And, you're, you're, and by the way, that's a pretty easy conviction for a prosecutor because unlike other legal defenses, like an alibi defense, you're saying, it wasn't me. I was someplace else, right? I was having dinner at my mama's house. An alibi defense is you denying your involvement in the criminal act. Self-defense is the opposite of that, folks. You're not saying it wasn't me. <laughs> You're saying the opposite of that. You're saying it was me. It was me. I shot that guy. But I did it with the legal justification of self-defense. Okay? What happens if one of those required elements of self-defense can be disproven beyond a reasonable doubt. Self-defense as a legal justification collapses completely, is obliterated, doesn't exist for legal purposes. What's left of, I shot him in self-defense. I shot him is what's left. And that's, that's in effect a confession. In fact, technically speaking, historically speaking, self-defense was often referred to as a defense of confession and avoidance. You're confessing to the underlying conduct that the prosecution claims is a crime, but you're seeking to avoid legal liability based on the justification, confession and avoidance. But if the avoidance collapses, all that's left, folks, is the confession. So very important that you get it right. If you're inside the legal boundaries, zero criminal liability, not a crime. One inch out, one of those elements, disproven beyond a reasonable doubt, Zero justification, 100% criminal liability. So this also means, of course, that the prosecutor does not need to disprove your claim of self-defense in its entirety. He just has to disprove any one of the required elements, any one of them. The others could be 150% in your favor. But if one required element can be disproven beyond a reasonable doubt, that's it. You're done. And he's got your confession in hand already. You think he knows that going in? You think when he looks at that investigative report from the detectives, he knows what he needs to do? Yeah, 
He does. He knows where his opportunities are. And when he's reading that investigative reports from the Texas, what he's looking for is one of these five elements that appears to him to be vulnerable to disproof beyond a reasonable doubt. So from a legal analysis perspective, what actually happens isn't so much that these elements are considered in a positive way, what's here, but in a negative way, what's missing? Which one of these elements? These are all targets for attack by a prosecutor, folks. Every one of those is a target for attack by the prosecutor. And if he's successful in his attack on any one element, self-defense goes away as a legal justification. So when we look at these videos, a good way to look at them is to ask ourselves, well, which one are any of the elements apparently missing? Is, is innocence missing? Was the guy in the video who used force, was he the initial physical aggressor in the confrontation? Is imminence missing? Was he, was he not facing a threat either actually in progress or immediately about to occur? Is avoidance missing? Uh, did he have a legal duty to retreat? And in one of these videos, he certainly did uh, and failed to take advantage of that legal duty. Is proportionality missing? Did he use deadly defensive force under circumstances where he was not facing a deadly force threat? And then reasonableness, of course, did he have both a subjective and objectively reasonable belief in his need to use deadly force in self-defense? Assuming, of course, it was a deadly force encounter, which everyone here in, in these videos we're, we're going to be talking about, and certainly was. Um, so that's the question. When we look at these videos, we'll be asking ourselves, which one of the elements are missing? And by the way, folks, in at least one of these videos, they're all missing. So <laughs> they're all missing. doesn't make for a great claim of self-defense. By the way, <clears throat> this is why I say that uh, bad guy cases of self-defense and good guy cases of self-defense are so different. 99.9% .9 of claims of self-defense in the criminal justice system are BS. These are bad actors. These are traditional criminal defendants, meaning they're criminals. They used force unlawfully. And now they're trying to escape criminal liability by claiming self-defense. They may not even have thought of self-defense, but a, their lawyer would raise the legal defense of self-defense because that's what you do as a lawyer. You don't not raise it just because you don't believe it as a defense lawyer. You raise the legal defenses you think you can argue in court. But they're BS, and they're generally easy, easily defeated. Like, for example, in, in one of these videos we're going to see, particularly the one with the guy with the hatchet, um, I would suggest that every element of self-defense is missing, uh, to the point where it wouldn't surprise me if a trial judge were to deny the privilege of the defense to argue self-defense at all that the trial judge, that the prosecution would argue, I would as the prosecutor, and the judge would agree that the defendant has failed to meet his burden of production because there's zero evidence to support one or more or all of the required elements of self-defense. So in that scenario, you fail to meet your burden of production, the jurors will never hear the word self-defense in a trial. Or if the judge allows the argument to be made during the trial to see what evidence may develop, maybe the burden of production can be met through the course of the trial. If it's not met by the end, by the time the defense rests, then the jury won't get a jury instruction on self-defense. So they, they can't arrive at a verdict based on a jury instruction they don't get, obviously. Um, now, most bad guy cases of self-defense, there's multiple elements easily disprovable beyond a reasonable doubt. It's indisputable that they're not present. There's zero evidence to support them. And, and so that's those bad guy claims of self-defense often get defeated like that very easily on multiple fronts. And by the way, like I said, 99.9% .9 of claims of self-defense are those, are the bad guy claims of self-defense. Now, you think a prosecutor who for every 100 claims of self-defense, 99.9 .9 of them are obvious BS. You think that might bias his perspective to self-defense claims generally? Yeah. You think it might do the same for the judge? Yes. So for the professionals in the criminal justice system, they see a claim of self-defense and uh, by default in their minds, it's, it's another BS claim of self-defense. And by the way, that's true of the defense attorneys too. I mean, most of the criminal defense attorneys I know who are my age, they've been practicing 30, 40 years. 
In a traditional criminal defense practice, you ask those lawyers how many good guy claims of self-defense they've had, meaning defenders who are not habitual criminals, defenders who are normal law-abiding people, never been in trouble with the law a day in their lives, and find themselves charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon because they displayed the gun at somebody because they were scared of being hurt. You ask a traditional criminal defense attorney how many good guy cases of self-defense he's had in his entire career. Now, bad guy cases of self-defense, he may have had hundreds, many hundreds. Good guy cases of self-defense, you know what they'll tell you? 30-year career, 40-year career, three, four, five, maybe six genuine good guy cases of self-defense in 30 or 40 years of a legal career. If you do something half a dozen times over 30 or 40 years, you think you get really good at it? Probably not. Right. So we end up with a system where everyone, all the legal professionals involved, the prosecutor, the judge, the defense counsel, uh, they're not accustomed to seeing good guy cases as self-defense. They're a lot harder to win because they don't tend to be defective on a lot of the elements. Uh, they tend to be defective maybe marginally on one or two elements, usually one. Um, so the prosecutor also knows there in a good guy case of self-defense that it's going to be more difficult. Now, he, a prosecutor wouldn't typically characterize it as a good guy case of self-defense. If he thought it was a good guy case of self-defense, he's got the, the privilege entirely within his discretion to not bring the case to trial. So if he's bringing it to trial, either he believes it's a bad guy case of self-defense, maybe tougher than usual, or he's bringing the case for political purposes. The bottom line remains the same. He now has to find among those elements a vulnerable one, one that is subject to disproof beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's the approach we're going to take in, the, in this show today. So I'll just take a moment to remind everybody, uh, folks, we're going to play three videos. There's the wine bottle to the head in the convenience store video. There's the hatchet guy in uh, the New York City fast food joint video. And then there's the armed robber who can't hold on to his gun video. But I'm not playing the videos during the YouTube stream. We're going to get to a point where we're going to talk about the law first, the legal principles that apply in each of those. Uh, so if you want to find the videos yourself, you feel free to do that. But every time I show videos on YouTube, they demonetize me. It, it becomes pointless. And I don't care about the demonetizing. I don't care about, I don't make much money from YouTube. It doesn't matter to me, the, the money. But one consequence of being demonetized is they, uh, they basically zero out any propagation of your content. So nobody sees it. And I'm not doing this, so nobody will see what I'm doing, right? Uh, so we're just going to verbalize and talk about the legal principles. You find the video elsewhere. You want to do it that way, that's fine. I will play them. But at some point in today's show, we're going to cut off. I'll say goodbye to YouTube. We will continue without break the video stream to our Law of Self-Defense members. Uh, and we'll play the videos there just for our members exclusively. And you can become a member for less than 30 cents a month, uh, 30 cents a day, rather. It's, it's under $10 a month. Um, and you can do that. You see the U little URL at the bottom of my image, lawofselfdefense.com slash join. If you do it now, uh, you'll get the email within a few minutes with the username and password and everything you need to access the, uh, the member stream. Um, and again, if, if this stuff isn't worth less than 10 bucks a month to you, I don't, I don't need... I mean, how, did, how much do you value your time if you're here watching it at all? Um, I would think your time would be worth more than something that's not worth $10, but that's up to you, your call to make. All right, so let's talk first about this guy. This guy, Mr. Number One, number one. So again, we don't have all the context and all the facts and all the background in this case. It doesn't really matter for any of these videos. We're learning these as, using these as uh, learning opportunities. So we're gonna base everything we say on, um, just on the video itself. I, I do have some more background on the New York City hatchet guy reported in the media. It doesn't really change any of the analysis. So we'll mostly be relying on what we see here in these videos. All right, what, I, what I'm going to tell you we're going to see in the videos and what the, the, those of you who become members or are members will see. Uh, by the way, when you become a Law of Self-Defense member, that also has a chat and I answer every question in that chat. You don't have to pay super chat money to YouTube. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, Ross mentions in the comments here that uh, apparently he didn't get a notification about this show. It might have been because I had the word hatchet in the headline. I don't know. 
I don't know how YouTube does these things. Uh, you know who did get a notification about today's show? Our members did, and they know to watch it over at the members dashboard. So if you like the content, you want to be guaranteed to get notifications without YouTube intervening between you and the legal expertise you'd like to access. 30 cents a day, folks. That's all it takes. Um, let's see. Uh, folks, you don't, I'm not going to post the links to the videos. First of all, I, I didn't write them down or save them anywhere. Second of all, if you're a member, they're going to be in your member dashboard. So you, you can just access them there. And if you're not a member, why, how much effort do you expect me to put out for someone who's, I mean, not willing to contribute less than 10 bucks a month to the community? <laughs> uh, everybody likes free milk, I guess. All right. So this gentleman here, he's number one. He gets upset for some reason here. Uh, he punches this probably plastic barrier uh, between the clerk and uh, the uh, uh, and the customers. Now, it's it's probably not really a security. I don't know what this is supposed to be, this plastic barrier, if it's a COVID thing. I mean, when you're in a convenience store, I don't know where this is, but it, like in New York City, and they have barriers for security purposes, it's like a sealed container. So you can't just point the gun around it. This thing's pretty flimsy, but they're having some kind of verbal argument here. Uh, the gentleman with uh, I'm number one gets unhappy. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's like the uh, uh, the uh, New York City case where the um, the uh, the gentleman, the small clerk behind the counter uh, had to uh, stab the boyfriend to death because the boyfriend's woman's EBT card wouldn't work. Maybe we have another EBT card failure here. Who knows? doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm number one punches the barrier, backs up a little bit, but stays within a couple feet of that current location. And the clerk comes around the counter. And in the clerk's hand is a pretty substantial wine bottle. Uh, the clerk walks up to I'm number one, who pretty much stands his ground there. He's not running away. Uh, he's going to man up. And uh, he mans up. He takes uh, the wine bottle right to the left side of the noggin. Clerk's got it in the right hand. And you hear, I swear, you actually hear like a ding, like from a cartoon. It's bong. And uh, that, uh, you know, would shake anybody up. I'm sure it shakes up I'm number one a little bit. Uh, and the clerk decides he's not quite done yet. So he takes another full arm swing with this wine bottle, holding it by the neck uh, into the side of number one's head. And this time the bottle just explodes uh, the wine cascades over the little lottery stand sign uh, behind I'm number one. Uh, I mean, you you might almost think it was a bomb and that was, uh, you know, uh, the stuff inside your head, YouTube algorithm, uh, spraying all over the wall. But it wasn't. It was just the wine. And that really sh shakes up I'm number one. He's not doing well then. You can see he's, he's basically out on his feet. And that's pretty much where the video ends. So the question is, could it possibly have been lawful for the clerk to smash that bottle over on number one's head? Well, are any of these elements missing? Innocence, eminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. Uh, well, eminence, uh, sorry, innocence. Who was the initial physical aggressor? Now, you might think I'm number one was the initial physical aggressor because he punched that plastic. But was he really? I mean, his fist is not going through that plastic. He couldn't really hurt the guy on the other side of the barrier. It was a it was a show. And in any case, he didn't continue it. He doesn't try to get around the barrier. He doesn't try to reach through the little hole in the barrier where merchandise and cash is supposed to be traded. Uh, he punches the thing once in anger, and that's it. I would suggest that fight's over. If the clerk stays behind the counter, there's no reason to believe I'm number one is doing anything more. But the clerk doesn't stay behind the counter, does he? The clerk comes around the counter, walks a good, what, eight, 10 feet around the counter, wine bottle in hand. And he didn't bring the wine bottle because he was going to hand it over as a gift. He brought the wine bottle to use as a weapon aggressively against I'm number one. Does that make the clerk the initial physical aggressor in that second fight? Yeah, I would suggest it does. 
So the clerk's lost the element of innocence right there. That means he's lost self-defense. But let's go on. Let's con consider imminence. Was the clerk, when he swung that bottle, in the moment he made the decision to swing that bottle, was he facing in that moment a reasonably apparent active attack occurring or an attack immediately about to occur? I don't see that. I don't see this number one attacking him at that point. Number one's not walking away, but he's not aggressive. He's not punching. He's not advancing. So I would suggest the clerk has lost the element of imminence as well. Might there have been an imminent threat when the plastic screen was punched? Maybe. I mean, I guess potentially you could try to make that argument, especially if the punching continued and you had reason to think it, he might breach that plastic barrier. But that didn't happen. So I would suggest eminence is gone too. And if that's gone, you've lost self-defense. And now we've lost two of the five elements of self-defense. Uh, what about proportionality? Well, proportionality means that the defensive force has to be proportional to the uh, aggressive aggressor force. Uh, force is really put into two buckets, either non-deadly force or deadly force. Um, deadly force is any force capable of causing reasonably capable, not speculatively capable, but reasonably likely to cause death or serious bodily injury. Um, and non-deadly force is force not at that level, force not likely to cause death or serious bodily injury. You can only use deadly force in self-defense if you're facing a deadly force threat. That's the proportionality, deadly force to deadly force. If you're only facing a non-deadly force threat, you can only use non-deadly force in self-defense. There are exceptions around the margins, but that's the general principle that would apply here. So let's consider the clerk's degree of force. Was it non-deadly force or was it deadly force? If you smash someone in the head twice with a full... Sorry, folks. If you smash someone in the head twice, arm's length swing, holding the neck of the bottle, hard as you can, in the side of the head with a wine bottle. Is that reasonably likely to cause death or serious bodily injury? Especially when the second time you do it, it's hard enough to explode that bottle against their head. If someone were doing it to you, would you consider it likely to cause death or serious bodily injury? I would. So the clerk here, I would suggest, is using deadly defensive force upon Number one, was he facing a deadly force threat at that moment? He decided to swing the bottle and did swing the bottle twice into the head of number one. I don't see that. I don't see it. Does that mean number one was justified in punching the plastic screen earlier? No, but that's not the question. The question for proportionality is, was it when he was using deadly defensive force against number one, was he facing a deadly force threat from number one? I would suggest the answer is clearly no. So proportionality is off the table. What about avoidance? Well, for general purposes, I, I don't know if this was in a duty to retreat state or not, but even if it was the clerks in his own place of business, he wouldn't have an obligation to retreat in his own place of business. So avoidance is really irrelevant. And reasonableness both subjective and objective. Would an objective, reasonable, and prudent person have perceived that it was necessary under these circumstances to smash that bottle of wine against number one's head? Not, not if it would be enjoyable to do it. <laughs> That's a different question. Was it necessary because he reasonably perceived innocence, eminence, and proportionality? No. Innocence, eminence, and proportionality are laughable here. No reasonable person could perceive those to have been met. So we fail on reasonableness as well. So if this avoidance is effectively off the table because this is either in a stand your ground state or on the grounds that it would be in the clerk's own place of business uh, and all the other four elements are missing, this is a zero element self-defense scenario, folks, in terms of the legal defense of self-defense. There is nothing here. And this is precisely the kind of bad guy case of self-defense in which self-defense is immediately destroyed by the prosecution. There's no legal merit here at all. Again, when we switch over to the law of self-defense members only stream uh, shortly, 
Uh, I'll play the actual video for you and we'll talk through each of these elements as well. All right. The next video I wanted to discuss, I want to discuss, it's not like I'm done yet, is Mitch, Mr. Hatchet Attack. So this video starts off with uh, there seems to be some kind of verbal discussion going on. Uh, news reports say that the uh, the man with the backpack, hatchet man here, was being uh, to a level qualifying as harassment, apparently, uh, pestering a young woman in that eating area, um, just would not stop bothering her no matter how many times she asked him to go away. And, and ultimately, some young men intervened. By the way, for all the people who say, why doesn't anybody do anything when women are attacked? Well, this, these are guys doing something. Uh, so they're intervening. Um, then they end up throwing some punches at Mr. Hatchetman. Punches with no apparent effect. Mr. Hatchetman literally leans against the waste bucket area and just lets himself get punched. He's just standing there nonchalant. And when they're done, because they realize they're not having much effect, he, I guess, mocks them a little bit for that opens up his backpack. And by the way, folks, if you're in a physical non-deadly force confrontation with somebody and they put their backpack on the ground and start opening it up, get the hell out. Nothing good for you is coming out of that bag. They're not pulling flowers out of that bag. 99.9 .9 times out of 100, they're pulling a weapon out of that bag to use on you. If you can get out of town, now would be the time. Now, I'm not sure these guys did have that opportunity given the kind of physical setup here. Just a word to the wise. It's like when someone says, uh, uh, you know, if someone leaves the fight and then comes back. That's not good, folks. That's really, really bad. Or when someone tells you or asks you, hey, you got a problem? You know what? <laughs> Whether you thought you did or not, you have a problem. That's your problem. He's your problem. So a great way to solve these kinds of problems is to vacate and not be there. But in any case, this guy comes out with a hatchet. It appears to have a, a kind of cover over the blade, which doesn't really matter because he, he starts smashing a bunch of fairly robust furniture, glass panels, large glass panels. Furniture is breaking. He's shaking at people while he's yelling at them, which is certainly reasonably perceived as threatening conduct. Um, Oh, by the way, with the guy with the wine bottle, uh, the crime he could be charged with there is felony assault and battery with a deadly weapon, to wit, a bottle of wine. Now, we don't think of a bottle of wine as a deadly weapon. You don't need a concealed carry permit for it. But for use of force law purposes, anything can be a deadly weapon, pretty much. It all depends on the manner of use. If it's being used in a manner likely to inflict death or serious bodily injury, it's being used as a deadly weapon. Uh, I have shoelaces on my shoes. On my shoes, they're not deadly weapons, but I wrap it around your throat. Is it being used as a deadly weapon then? It sure is. So that wine bottle, you buy it, you go home, you drink it, not a deadly weapon. You break it over somebody's head, yep, deadly weapon. And because it's a assault, meaning the number one was put in fear, he saw the attack coming, he was put in fear of imminent deadly force harm uh, and a battery. So he actually was struck with deadly force, force. Um, it's a felony assault and battery with a deadly weapon. Potentially good for 10 to 20 years in prison, folks. So a pretty serious criminal offense by, the, by that clerk. <clears throat> now we have Mr. Hatchetman. Uh, well, we have much the same scenario, right? Is he, is he creating fear, reasonable perceptions of fear in those other people in that eating area? of imminent deadly force harm, even if they're not struck with the blade, just struck with the blunt ed edge of the hatchet that's destroying that furniture, is that likely to cause them death or serious bodily injury? Sure. So that's assault. That's felony assault. He's putting others in unjustified imminent fear of deadly force harm. Uh, is there a battery? Eh, there may be a simple battery. He slaps somebody a couple times, not with the hatchet. Uh, so remember, assault is putting someone in fear of harm. Battery is the actual touching. The assault here would certainly qualify as felony level. He's threatening people with a hatchet. The battery, I, I don't think he actually strikes anybody, any person with the hatchet. Of course, he strikes a lot of property with the hatchet. I focus mostly on you know, offenses against persons law, uh, but certainly you know, destroying someone else's property is a crime as well. 
Uh, so he, and depending on the value of the property destroyed and that glass panel alone is probably a couple thousand dollars. Uh, I'm not in the glass business, but it looks expensive. Uh, depending on the value of the property that's destroyed, it can certainly arise to the, uh, the level of a, the level of a uh, felony as well. So then the question would be, that would be the criminal charge against him, right? So certainly felony assault with a deadly weapon, um, at least misdemeanor battery and some kind of, you know, malicious, felonious destruction of property charge. Um, if the property destruction, you know, if none of this was justified, if it's justified, it's not a crime. So is there a justification here? Is there a self-defense justification? It would be hard to have a defense of property justification because the property is not attacking you, right? Uh, but could there be a self-defense justification? If there is, then this conduct is not criminal. Zero criminal liability, right? If you meet the conditions of self-defense. Otherwise, 100% probability. So how do we look at this? We look at the five elements of self-defense, not today in a firm affirmative sense, but in a negative sense, are any of these missing? So let's look at innocence first. Um, was this guy the initial physical aggressor in the confrontation? And I would suggest he was in a couple of senses. One is, did we see early on he's being punched by these other young men? Um, okay, fair enough. Let's pretend their punching of him was completely unjustified. That was an unlawful act of aggression by them. Well, that stopped. There was a pause. That had ended before he ever put his backpack down and pulled the hatchet out. When he's pulling the hatchet out, he's not being attacked by anybody. And there's no apparent imminent attack about to occur. So one way I believe he fails on innocence is that one, really there's two separate fights. There's a when he's being punched, and he certainly he would have a privilege, or at least arguably, depending on what led to the punches, of course. But even if we imagine that he had a privilege of self-defense against the punches, uh, once that fight ends, that fight ends. And then he is the initial physical aggressor in a second fight. The fight that is triggered or is initiated by his retrieval of the hatchet. So I would suggest... Once he gets the hatchet out, he's not under active attack or imminent attack. He's the initial physical aggressor in that second fight. So he's lost innocence. He's lost self-defense. What about eminence? Well, eminence is like a window, folks. Eminence meaning, of course, you're either actively under attack or an attack's immediately about to occur. Well, there was a point when he was actively under attack. The punches, he was actively under attack. He could have defended himself then from the punches. But again, the punches ended. That fight was over. So the window of eminence had opened when he was started being punched. The window of eminence closed when the punching stopped and he was no longer under imminent threat. Eminence was not there. At the time, he pulls the hatchet out of his backpack and starts threatening people with it. So for the purposes of the hatchet attack, there is no imminent threat against him. So he loses eminence there and therefore loses self-defense for the hatchet conduct. Uh, what about proportionality? Well, I mean, you could try to make an argument that when he was being punched, he's being punched by multiple people. It's a disparity of numbers. Uh, I mean, he just stands there and lets them punch him, and he doesn't appear to have any negative effect on him at all. So it would be hard to say a reasonable person would perceive even that disparity of numbers attack is really likely to cause death or serious bodily injury. Certainly, you know, how do we, it has to be subjectively believed by him as well that he was suffering death or serious bodily injury. And how do we know what's going on in someone's head? Well, we can infer from their conduct and his conduct is very lackadaisical. He does not present as someone who believes he's being victimized with deadly force. So I would suggest proportionality is missing as well. Certainly he was wielding deadly force in the form of that hatchet, even if only the blunt edge was going to be used. So proportionality, fail, off the table, lose self-defense for that. Uh, what about avoidance? Well, this happened to occur in New York, New York City, part of New York State, and New York State is one of the 11 stand your ground states, meaning before you can resort to deadly defensive force, you have to take advantage of a safe avenue of retreat if you have one. Did he have one? Yes, he did have one, folks. There was nothing preventing him from simply walking away. Instead, he put his backpack on the ground, unzipped it, and took out a hatchet and started threatening people. But at that moment, when he could have either 
have initiated that second deadly force fight or walked away safely. No one was pursuing him. No one was beating him. He didn't do that. He didn't take advantage of that safe avenue of retreat. Now, in most states, it wouldn't really matter in an otherwise lawful case of self-defense. Of course, this case of self-defense is not otherwise lawful, as we've noted. Uh, but in New York State, they are extremely aggressive. All 11 of the duty to retreat states are uh, if I said New York would stand your ground, I meant duty to retreat. It's one of the 11 duty to retreat states. Um, all of them are very, very aggressive in attacking that element of avoidance. If an attack like that is available to them, you fail to retreat. This guy's failure to retreat would lose him avoidance, which is a required element in New York State, and loses him self-defense as a result. Uh, and of course, if you failed all the other elements, reasonableness, again, really applies to your perceptions, decisions, your actions with respect to the other elements. It's kind of an umbrella element that sits on, over the others. If all the other elements have failed, clearly they weren't reasonably present. So he fails unreasonable. So again, a classic bad guy case of self-defense. There's literally nothing here. You know, you've probably heard me say the George Zimmerman trial, there, there was literally zero evidence inconsistent with self-defense in the Zimmerman case. Well, here there's zero evidence consistent with self-defense. I mean, there's nothing here. So, yeah, and then he biked away on his little yellow bicycle. So nothing here, a classic bad guy case of self-defense. This is the, uh, you know, 999 out of 1,000 claims of self-defense in the criminal justice system look like this. I mean, they're ridiculously bad. They're not even close to being self-defense. Failure to meet your burden of production, not being allowed to argue self-defense to a jury is a real risk in this kind of catastrophically failed self-defense. Okay, the third video I'll be playing, and folks, we're only minutes away now from switching over to the uh, Law of Self-Defense Members Only stream. So if you want to actually watch the videos here, the analysis explained uh, you know, briefly, since we've covered the law pretty much, in the context of the actual videos, you need to be a Law of Self-Defense member. You can do that at lawofselfdefense.com slash join. It's less than 10 bucks a month, folks. Cheaper than any kind of super chat content for sure. So uh, if you want to take advantage of that opportunity, now would be the time. In just a few minutes, we're switching over. We'll be saying goodbye to the YouTube audience. So the last video I want to share with all of you will be this one. Uh, let's see. I can make this one a little bit bigger. Uh, this dude walks into this place of business. I don't know what it is. Maybe a cell phone store. It's, it's hard to know. But he walks in, very nonchalant, pulls out a gun uh, to rob this poor woman and uh, immediately loses control of the gun. It skids across the counter to the far side of the counter, which apparently is a pretty substantive barrier here. Uh, and uh, to the woman's side. of the, now, So now she's got a gun. <laughs> she's got his gun. Uh, it does appear the parts fly off the gun. I don't know if it's still functional. Uh, when she when she ultimately picks it up, first she looks at it like it's a, I don't know, like it's a poisonous jellyfish coming across the uh, counter at her. Uh, but she does, after a moment, pick it up. She's holding it in her hands. This guy uh, needs to do a little exercise or something because he tries to haul his butt over that counter and <laughs> can't do it. Uh, and by then the woman's picked up the gun and he prudently decides uh, to uh, win this fight by not being present. And he runs out back to the store. I doubt the gun was operational. It looks to me like the magazine came off, the grips broke off. Maybe it's not even a real gun. Maybe it was an airsoft thing and it just came apart when it hit the ground. Um, so, uh, so you know, although why would he run like that then? He certainly ran like someone who looked like he might be a little worried about getting shot. Uh, but the real question is, uh, could the woman have shot him? Let's pretend the gun comes across the counter, lands on the floor right at your feet. You're the clerk. Can you pick it up and just shoot that guy? Well, of course, what would matter is are the five elements of self-defense present? For example, at the moment you're deciding whether or not to shoot, are you the innocent victim of someone else's unlawful aggressive force? Well, clearly she is. She's the victim of an armed robbery, right? So innocence is checked off. What about imminence, though? So when he's getting the gun out, well, there's an imminent threat right? And in fact, let's deal with the others. Proportionality, it's a deadly force threat. Avoidance, you're not going to outrun a bullet. Uh, reasonableness, I think she's reasonably perceiving what's going on. Um, so if she's facing an imminent threat, 
I think the other elements of self-defense are also satisfied and she would be justified in shooting this guy dead, using deadly defensive force upon him. But the key question would be, is there an imminent threat? That's what's required. That's the one questionable, ambiguous condition here. Uh, now, could there be? Uh, I would suggest yes. <laughs> when that guy tries to haul himself over that counter, what's he really doing? He's going for a gun, his own gun that he dropped over the counter, but nevertheless, he's going for a gun. If this woman already had her own gun, concealed carry pistol on her hip, and this guy was reaching for that gun on the floor, could she shoot him then? Would him reaching for the gun represent an imminent deadly force threat? Sure. She'd be able to use her own gun to shoot him. Well, in this case, it's even worse because if he gets control of the gun, she's lost her gun. We're presuming she doesn't have her own. Presuming there's only one guy in the fight, one gun in the fight, only one of them has it. So if he manages to grab the gun, not only does he has now again armed himself, but he's disarmed her. And under those circumstances, when he's apparently attempting to arm himself, I would suggest he's still an eminent threat at that moment. But again, the element of eminence is like a window. It opens and closes. When he's trying to haul himself over the counter, yeah, sure, I would characterize that as an eminent threat. But when he gives up that effort and he's running out of the store, still an eminent threat, or has the window of eminence closed at that point? Could you shoot him in the back as he's running out? I would suggest not. He's no longer an imminent threat. So whether or not she'd be justified in shooting him, of course, depends on the specific facts in play at the time she makes the decision to shoot. And like any self-defense analysis, small changes in facts can have large, very large changes in outcome. Uh, so hopefully... I was just going to say, hopefully no one did any super chats here, but I see that someone just did, which I appreciate. Um, I know it's made out of kindness. Just me. Thank you very much for your 999 super chat. That's actually more money than it costs to be a law self-defense member for an entire month where you get all your questions answered on these shows for free. So, uh, and YouTube doesn't take a third of the member money. That just comes to me and Miss Emily. So again, folks, I'm, I would discourage you. I, I, I need to figure out now how to shut off the Super Chat function because I don't want you to pay Super Chats here. None, okay? Um, uh, whatever money you would pay YouTube, take a fraction of it and just become a law self-defense member. Have unlimited access to all our content. An infinite number of questions you ask during the shows, I'll be happy to answer. And you get all the videos that I can't put on YouTube because they just demonetize me. And you can do all that at lawselfdefense.com slash join. All right, folks. Uh, at this point, I am going to say YouTube. Thank you for joining us. Hope you like the legal explanation. It's time to get to the actual videos themselves. And that is not airing on YouTube. That's airing for our Law of Self-Defense members only. If you're watching on Rumble, Rumble's also going away. Uh, so thank you, YouTube. Thank you, Rumble. Uh, much appreciate your company. Hope you learned some stuff today. Hope you found it informative. And uh, those of you watching on the Law of Self-Defense uh, member dashboard, stay right where you are. Nothing should change for you. I just have to turn off these other two streams. Bye-bye, YouTube. Take care. Oops, let's see.